was the loud introduction to our uh, church camp at White Mills. Uh, you know where White Mills is, just south of us here. Uh, we support that camp, and uh, it is a good camp. It's, it's good for our children and a lot of adult programs as well. So you just saw a glimpse of a hundred different things that they do there at the church camp. So welcome. We're glad you're here this morning at Linden Christian Church. And uh, there's a scripture I want to share with you from Psalm 119, a couple of verses that say, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. The one thing that brings us together as a church family is believing in God's commandments, believing in the Bible, and letting the Bible be our guide and teach us. And uh, we're, we're blessed here in that uh, we have a preacher that preaches from the Word of God. Every church doesn't have that. He uh, doesn't just preach from uh, the newspapers or the latest events that are going on, but he lets God speak to us through his preaching and lets the Word be read. And so we're blessed at that. And as we begin our service today, we're going to start in a moment with a prayer. But let me just mention, <clears throat> there are some prayer lists on the table in the foyer, if you'd like to pick one up. There are two or three things I might just have you add to your prayer list. Uh, one is that uh, uh, Joan Hicksonbaugh's son, David, and you many of you know Joan. Joan's one of our older widows here in the church. And... Uh, and uh, Evan, I think you said David was here last Sunday for Easter with Joan. Steve was. Oh, Steve was. Okay, well, that's another one of her boys. But David, her son, it's very, very tough. He has lung cancer. And so we need to be in prayer for Joan and for her son and for the family and, uh, and uh, this serious, serious situation. And uh, glad to see Mary Winkler back in church this morning. Mary has been suffering from a from an infection and not legionnaire's disease that was erroneously put out on a on a on an email but has been really suffering with this infection so we thank god that mary is here and we want to keep mary in our prayers and also we need to remember shirley trader shirley's going through some uh, tough times with her with her teeth she has some broken teeth, some cracked teeth, and maybe some cavities, and uh, she's going to need some dental work, and she's being consulted on that. Uh, she goes through the VA as much as she can, and so uh, we need to pray for her in those needs, and there are many others on our prayer list, and I know that some of you are not feeling as well as you could, and uh, we pray for you too. Let's go to God now in prayer as we lift all these needs up to the Lord. Shall we pray together? Thank you, Father. You love us and care for us. Your word speaks to us and we follow in your footsteps. Thank you for our Savior, Jesus. It's just a week past uh, Great Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, when we celebrated the resurrection of Christ from the grave. But Father, we know that he lives. He lives forevermore and he is our Savior. And we look forward to eternity with you, Father, with your Son and the Spirit in, uh, in heaven. And we just pray that you would be with our prayer needs this morning, be with these who are upon our prayer list, the uh, new ones that we've mentioned that we're adding to the list. And Father, for so many who are suffering, some with some stress-related uh, problems, some with family issues, some, Father, with their own uh, pain and suffering and physical ailments, Father, we lift up ourselves to you in prayer, lift up these needs to you in prayer. We ask, Father, that you would bless us, be with us, help us, guide us, be with our worship service this morning, Father, that in all things we might lift up Jesus in what we say and do. Bless us now, in the name of Christ our Savior, we pray, amen, amen. In the 22nd chapter of Luke's Gospel, beginning with verse 17, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. 
do this in remembrance of me. When we arrive at this point in the early in the earthly ministry of Jesus, it is very quickly drawing to a close. As a matter of fact, within the next 24 hours, we will find that Jesus uh, will have been betrayed, he will have been crucified, and he will be buried, fortunately, in a borrowed tomb. In 40 days, we will see that he has returned to the Father. And so we are very, very, very quickly approaching the end of his earthly ministry. Now that would be a sad occasion if that were the end of it. But as blessed people as we are, we find that if you look in the book of Acts, we find out that we are not alone. He has not left us. And if you look in the second chapter of the book of Acts in verse 38, a passage of scripture that all of us are very, very familiar with, it tells that that the Spirit is placed with us when we are immersed into Christ. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To me, that means the Spirit of God is permanently instilled within me. And between the Easter Sunday of 1957 and where I stand before you today, the Spirit of God has indwelled in me, been in me, and lived in me. Now, I'm granting to myself this morning and to you that I have really tried his patience down through the years since that took place. But I still hold great comfort in the fact that I can believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is in me in spirit. You see, our real problem is that as we live our daily lives as people and as Christians, we lose sight of the fact that we have the Spirit of God within us. So our Heavenly Father has provided a means for us to remind ourselves of His presence in our everyday life. And this form of remembrance is what brings us together at this moment. We are here to remember the sacrifice made for us on Calvary. Now, if I could only sing, fear not, I am not going to. Boy, I wish I could. Just once I'd like to be able to do that. <laughs> Deborah Brandon put it this way. Come into the presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise and give him praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voice is raised. Your voice is raised. Give glory and honor and power unto him. Jesus, the name above all names. The reminder that we want to take away from our time together this morning is simply this. We are always in his presence. When we come to the table, we come into his presence. When we pray, we come into his presence. When we study his word, we come into his presence. When we are together as a body, we come into his presence. Those are inspirational, uplifting events. But always keep in mind that in a 24-7 aspect of our physical life, we are always in the presence of the Heavenly Father. That just encourages me and lifts me up. And I want you to use that as a reminder this morning that we always, absolutely always, without a shadow of a doubt, forever and ever and ever, have the presence of the Lord in us, and we have come into his presence this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for every blessing you share with us. But Father, we thank you so very, very, very much this morning that we are able to come into your presence and be into your presence in an uplifting and a spiritual way. And we thank you for walking with us. We thank you for meeting our every need. 
And Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice on Calvary that was made for us, that we might have the hope, the promise of life everlasting, life eternal. Thank you for all that you do for us and for loving us. It's in your precious Son's name that we pray. Amen. The body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Good morning. Well, thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. Uh, it's good seeing everyone here this morning. Um, let's pray before we get started. God, thank you so much for today, and uh, we thank you for uh, everyone here and um, the opportunity that we have here together to, uh, to gather together to praise your name uh, for uh, the great things that you have done. Uh, we praise you for your mighty deeds and the mightiest of all, uh, resurrection and uh, conquering death. Uh, by coming back from the grave. Uh, we thank you so much for uh, the, the revelation that we have in your word uh, that tells us all about you and who you are and how much you love us and what you have done for us. Uh, I pray that uh, your word would penetrate our hearts and, and change how we live. Uh, that, that it wouldn't just be something that we um, agree with, something that we think is good, uh, but it would be impactful and transform our lives. Uh, it's in your name I pray. Amen. A Russian spy, a turncoat, a traitor during the Cold War, saved the world from all-out nuclear destruction. A Roman spy, a turncoat, a traitor during the siege of Jerusalem, failed to save the Jews from near total destruction. Now let me start off this morning by telling you two different stories about two famous turncoats. Now, the first took place in 1983. Ronald Reagan was president in the United States uh, and the Soviet Union had been in the midst of a Cold War for decades. The United States government was absolutely terrified that the Soviets would launch nuclear missiles at any moment. So in an effort to prepare for such an event, the U.S. military began practicing war games exercises. In November of 1983, the United States military executed a war game called Abel Archer. Uh, this particular war game was a simulation of DEFCON 1 coordinated nuclear strikes by NATO forces in Belgium. Abel Archer included an increased realism on the part of multiple heads of, of state throughout Europe. This war game was so realistic that the Soviet government believed it to be a genuine nuclear first strike. So the Soviet military prepared their actual nuclear forces and they placed air units in eastern Germany and Poland in preparation for the attack. This was as close the world had ever gotten to all-out nuclear war since the Cuban Missile Crisis. On the brink of all-out nuclear destruction, one man was able to intercede and save the world from annihilation. In the 1960s, a Russian spy named Oleg Gordievsky defected to the British intelligence agency MI6. <clears throat> he was a former KGB agent and he went to work at the British Soviet Embassy. Now, the Soviets placed him there as a spy to spy on the British. But he was a turncoat, a double agent. As he gave false information to the Soviets, he filtered actual intelligence information to the British. He did this for almost 20 years. In 1983, when NATO was running their war games exercise and the Soviets had their finger on the red button, Oleg Gordievsky was in a unique position to know what was happening on both sides. He, he knew that Abel Archer was a harmless drill and not a genuine first strike. And he also knew, unbeknownst to all of the rest of NATO, that the Soviets were nervous and on the brink of an actual nuclear strike in retaliation. It was entirely because of Gordievsky's arbitration that the U.S. finally believed that the Soviets were actually afraid of a nuclear strike. 
And they weren't just supervillains bent on the destruction of the world. In fact, in Ronald Reagan's autobiography, he said that it was because of Gordievsky that he wanted to get into a room alone with top Soviet leaders and convince them that the United States had no plans to send nuclear bombs to the Soviet Union and that they had nothing to fear from us. It was one Russian spy, a turncoat, a a traitor, that ultimately led to the end of the Cold War. The second story started in A.D. 66 in the city of Caesarea. Uh, Greek merchants were sacrificing birds outside a local synagogue. This offended the Jews inside the synagogue, and they reported this incident to Roman officials. The Roman authorities did nothing about it. They didn't care. This caused tensions between the two groups, the Jews and the Romans, to rise until a riot broke out among the Jews in Caesarea. This riot eventually led to an all-out revolt against the occupying Roman forces. The Jewish rebels eventually took back control of most of the nation of Israel. But in AD 70, just four years later, Roman forces were deployed to regain control of Israel, led by future emperor General Titus. Uh, The Roman forces fought the Jewish rebels until they only had control of the city of Jerusalem left. Uh, The city of Jerusalem was their Alamo. It was their last stand. It was all they had left. Uh, The Romans laid siege to the city for four months. They were able to break through two of the three walls Uh, surrounding the city, and the rebels were contained to the northern part of the city where the temple uh, was located. And figuring that the Jewish rebels would eventually come to their senses after four months of virtual starvation, Titus sent a man named Josephus to reason with the Jewish rebels. Josephus was a Jewish historian. He wrote a very lengthy history of the Jewish people. Uh, He wrote this history during the same exact uh, time the writers in the New Testament wrote what they wrote. Uh, He he used the same language, he used the same vernacular that the New Testament authors used. Other than being a historian, uh, Josephus was also a leader in the Jewish militia militia, uh, fighting against the Romans. Uh, His unit had been captured uh, by the Romans and pretty much immediately uh, upon capture, Josephus defected back to the Romans. He he became a turncoat, a traitor. And so during the siege of Jerusalem, the Romans sent this man, Josephus, to talk to his fellow countrymen, to try to convince them to give up and surrender. So Josephus walked up to the wall surrounding the northern portion of the city of Jerusalem, and he shouted over the wall, to the Jews on the inside. The word that Josephus screamed over the wall was one word. The word was metanoia. Metanoia. Repent. Uh, We're starting a brand new sermon series uh, this morning on the topic of baptism. This series is called What's Standing in the Way? At Acts 8, a man named Philip uh, told a man from Ethiopia about Jesus. He shared the gospel with him. And then the Ethiopian man looked over and he saw a body of water and he asked that question. What's standing in the way of me being baptized right now? Uh, Through this series, we're going to take some common reasons uh, that people give for not being baptized. And we're going to see what the Bible says about those common objections to baptism. And we're going to talk about some some common uh, misconceptions that people have uh, about baptism. Uh, This morning, I want to talk about one common objection that many people have about getting baptized. Whenever I uh, talk about getting baptized with someone, sometimes they will tell me that they do not need to be baptized because they were baptized as an infant. They they were sprinkled in the Catholic Church or in a Reformed Church like the Presbyterian Church. And because they were sprinkled as an infant, 
Uh, they don't think that they need to be baptized as an adult. Uh, they, they don't think they need to be immersed. They were sprinkled. Why would I be baptized if I was already baptized? This is the common question. Some have asked, uh, why does the amount of water matter? Does it matter if it's just a sprinkling or being immersed fully uh, underwater? I've also been asked, why does it matter if you receive baptism and then believe versus believing and then being baptized? Why does it matter? What's the difference? Uh, So this is the objection that I want to address this morning. And so uh, when when answering any objection, uh, I don't want to just tell you what I think. I don't want to tell you what someone else thinks uh, or what some Bible scholar thought a thousand years ago. Uh, I want to tell you what the Bible says about the issue. And what the Bible says is that baptism is intricately linked to the concept of repentance. So much so that one without the other precludes the other. They are two parts of a whole. If one is missing, it's incomplete. They go hand in hand. Repentance without baptism invalidates the repentance. And baptism without repentance invalidates the baptism. But before we get to that, let me tell you exactly what the word repentance means. There's a lot of people that have uh, uh, different uh, thoughts on that word. Uh, A lot of people have grown up being told what that word means in a variety of ways. Uh, But I want to talk about uh, how it was used by the authors of the Bible in the first century. The same exact way that Josephus used it when he yelled over the wall. Uh, Back then, it was not a churchy word. Uh, Today, nobody really uses the word repent unless they're in church, right? You don't really hear this in your everyday life because it's typically associated with church. It's a word you hear at church, but really nowhere else. Uh, But in the first century, it was an everyday, ordinary word. It simply meant to change your mind. Uh, The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. Uh, This word is made up of two parts uh, that come together that that help us to understand what it means. The prefix meta, it means after. And the suffix noia means thought or mind. Now we have an English word that actually comes from the Greek paranoia. Okay, in the, in the Greek, that word para means beside, and noia means thought or mind, and so it means that you are beside your mind. That's the literal definition of it. But metanoia, it literally means afterthought, or what we might say would be a second thought. It simply meant to think again. Or to change your mind. You were going to have fish for dinner, but then you thought about it again. You had a second thought and you decided, no, we're going to have chicken tonight and fish tomorrow. You have changed your mind. That's all that the word repent means. It means to change your mind. Uh, When Josephus went to the wall of Jerusalem and he yelled to his countrymen, repent, he was imploring them to change their mind, to think again, to rethink what you are doing. It isn't just changing your mind. It isn't just saying, well, uh, I don't believe that anymore. It means that because you have changed your mind, you are going to change your actions. Uh, When Josephus uh, shouted this uh, over the wall, he was imploring his countrymen to rethink what they were doing. He was imploring them to change what they were doing, to rethink their rebellion. The word metanoia was used to not just express how you have changed your mind, but to express your commitment to your decision. I was committed to do this, but now I have repented and now I'm committed to doing this. It was a change of allegiance. Josephus was imploring the Jews to change their allegiance back 
to the Romans to be turncoats. Because if they didn't, they would be utterly destroyed. And if you know your history, that's exactly what happened. Uh, if you've been going to church for uh, a long time, you have probably uh, gotten the idea that repentance is that you try really, really hard not to sin. And if you do, you should be really, really sorry that you did. Uh, a lot of us uh, grew up being taught that that's what repentance means. But that, is, that isn't repentance. That is simply behavior modification. It's trying really, really hard not to do something and then feeling bad about it later. That isn't changing your mind. It isn't changing your allegiance. Repentance is changing your commitment to what you've decided in your mind to do. Repentance is switching allegiances. It's switching teams. Repentance is completely changing who you're fighting for, who you're living for, who you're dedicating your heart, your mind, and your soul to. You are defecting from one side to the other. Repentance is a declarative statement, a one-time, life-changing event where you once and for all switch teams. Repentance does not mean that you are just turning away from committing a sin. Like, like you, you messed up and you promised not to do it again. That isn't repentance. Repentance is making the declaration that you are changing your mind about how you're going to live your life from here on out. You're changing your mind about who you're going to be living for from here on out. How do I know that repentance does not mean that you're just going to decide to stop sinning? Well, the Bible actually tells us that God himself repented. That's blasphemous in some churches, but I'll show it to you. At Acts 32, uh, Moses came down from Mount Sinai. He found the Israelites in the, the midst of a wild festival uh, worshiping a golden calf. And God declared that he was going to destroy the people of Israel because of their betrayal, because of their apostasy. But Moses begged God to change his mind. And in Exodus 32, 14, it says this, Then the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Other versions use that word, repented. They change it because it sounds blasphemous, but it's not. It's the Hebrew word, nakam, which in Greek is metanoia. God repented. He changed his mind. God does not need to turn away from sin. He does not need to decide that he needs to stop sinning. So it's pretty evident that's not what the word is referring to. It means to change your mind, which leads to a change in action. God changed his mind, and he decided not to destroy the people of Israel. Uh, John the Baptist, he preached to the Israelite people, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Meaning, change your allegiance from the kingdom of Israel to the kingdom of God. Because it, it's about to be established. Jesus later preached the exact same message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And this repentance in the New Testament was coupled with baptism. John preached this message of repentance, and people were baptized when they actually did it. Same with Jesus and his message. The Greek word for baptism is baptizo. That's where we get the word baptism. It's just a transliteration of the Greek word. But like metanoia, this was a very common, everyday, ordinary word. Today, we typically just hear about it in church. You don't really use it in your everyday life. But back then, it was used all the time. It was the common, in the common, common vernacular. Uh, people used it all the time. In fact, uh, there was a parchment of papyrus that was found by archaeologists. Uh, that was dated to the first century. And it was the small piece of parchment 
little piece of paper and that had written on it a recipe for pickles. Now, in this recipe, the instructions said to baptizo a cucumber in water and then baptizo a cucumber in vinegar. That's how you make p- pickles. Uh, the, word, the Greek word literally meant to immerse, to fully submerge the object underwater. That's all that the word meant. In fact, every instance of baptism in the New Testament describes the event as an immersion in water. Uh, Jesus' baptism is recorded at Matthew 3, verse 16. This is what it says. And when Jesus was baptized, when he was baptizo, immediately he went up from the water. Uh, this, was a, this is a clear description of baptism by immersion. Likewise, at Acts 8, the, the passage I mentioned earlier uh, the, the, with the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, the, one of the early Christians named Philip, he was traveling around, he shared the gospel with this Ethiopian man, uh, and the eunuch saw this body of water and he, was at, he asked to be baptized. And at, at Acts 8.39, it says, they came up out of the water. Uh, Because the New Testament describes the mode of baptism as immersion in water, that is what we practice here at this church. But not only because it was the mode of baptism used in the New Testament, it was the only accepted form of baptism for the first few hundred years of the church. Uh, The first recorded instance of anyone being baptized in any other way other than immersion was in 253 A.D., 200 years, more than 200 years, after Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, there was a man named Novation. He was gravely ill, and and he was bedridden. He, He was fully convinced that the forgiveness of his sins was dependent on his baptism. But he couldn't get out of bed. He, he, drew, he grew deeply concerned about his salvation because he was unable to be immersed. However, there was a local bishop in the area who permitted him to be fully doused with water from head to toe as a substitution for full immersion. Now, this account is recorded for us by the historian Eusebius, and it is the earliest known occurrence of anyone being baptized in any other way other than immersion. Uh, another historian, Cyprian, he mentioned that this new mode of baptism was only for emergencies. And it came to be known as clinical baptism, based on the Greek word for a small bed or a couch, klein. That's where we get the word clinic. But it was only for emergencies. If someone was bedridden, there was this substitution that was allowed. But in any other instance, it was always baptism by immersion. Baptism by immersion was still considered the normal mode of baptism. Early Christian writers Tertullian in his work on baptism, Origen in his work Homilies on Exodus, Basil of Caesarea in his work on the Holy Spirit, and Cyril of Jerusalem in his work Catechetical uh, Lectures all refer to baptism clearly as being by immersion, an action where a person is immersed in water. Uh, Over the course of hundreds of years, the exception became accepted as the norm. It wasn't until 753 A.D., 500 years after the incident with Novation, Pope Stephen declared that these uh, exceptions were officially acceptable. It wasn't even official doctrine until 753. And in in 1311 A.D., the Council of Ravenna declared that the mode of baptism was inconsequential, that it didn't matter. Upon the, rest, uh, the Pro- uh, Protestant Reformation, many denominations took up sprinkling as their accepted mode of baptism. But again, because this is how it was practiced in the New Testament, this is how we practice it here at this church. We want to be a New Testament church. Uh, but the early church held deeply to the, uh, to the conviction that baptism was for the forgiveness of sins. Th- throughout the writings of the early church fathers, baptism is closely associated with the forgiveness of sins, with salvation, eternal life, regeneration of the sinner, the gift of the Holy Spirit, as Tom mentioned earlier. 
This notion was held so deeply that by the 4th century, theologians began suggesting that infants should be baptized. This practice did not occur for the first three, 400 years of the church. But their reasoning uh, was twofold, why infants should begin to start getting baptized. First, in, a, in an age of high child mortality, there was great concern over the salvation of children. Children who died before being baptized. Theologians began suggesting that newborn infants should receive baptism by sprinkling in order to ensure their salvation in the event they died before they were able to be fully immersed. Uh, Secondly, uh, the idea of waiting until a child comes of age is a little bit precarious. Uh, it's, uh, it's an idea that uh, uh, they might grow up and decide not to do it themselves. So if they were baptized as an infant, even if they decide to repudiate the faith later on, they still were baptized as an infant. That was the, uh, the reasoning behind the, the practice of infant baptism beginning. Now, however, infant baptism, according to the Bible is completely unnecessary. Now, the Bible teaches that children are born in a state known as original grace. Now, some churches teach that, that babies uh, are born into a state known as original sin. Uh, they, they use this idea to support the practice of infant baptism. Now, this is the idea that babies are born guilty of sin simply because they are born into the human race. Uh, This is uh, the idea that Adam sinned in the garden, and so because of his sin, it left an indelible stain on all of humanity. So every single person born after Adam's sin is guilty by association. But the Bible does not say that. It's a, a misconception that many people have. The Bible does not say that babies are born into original sin. In fact, what it says is they are born into original grace. This is what Romans 4.15 says. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. Romans 5.13 says sin is not counted where there is no law. Both of these verses indicate that God does not hold a person accountable who has no knowledge of God's law. They are not guilty of sin if they have no knowledge of God's law. This would include children who are unable to understand that their wrongdoing is a sin against God. This would include a mentally handicapped person who's unable to comprehend the concept of sin. Uh, This would include a person who's never heard uh, of the Bible. They've never read the Bible. They don't know God's law. They aren't held accountable for what they don't know. It would include a person uh, who's never put their faith in Jesus, who's never heard the name Jesus before. They aren't held accountable for not putting their faith in Jesus, specifically, because they have never heard of that. The salvation of an infant, the salvation of a child is not in question because they're under original grace. And so it doesn't need to be resolved. There's no conflict. Infant baptism is unnecessary because infants are in the state of original grace. There's no law for them, so they're no, not guilty of any sins. And that's, so that's why we don't practice infant baptism. That's why infants don't need to be baptized. However, when a a child matures to the point when they do comprehend the concept of sin and and they understand that they sin and that they violate God's law, this is when they become guilty of their own personal sin and when they need to be forgiven of that sin. And that is when baptism would be necessary. We call this the age of accountability. It's different for every child. It depends on when they uh, mature and develop and uh, begin to understand what sin is. But if you yourself are able to understand that you sin, you are guilty. 
The Bible tells us exactly what to do in order to be forgiven. Whenever anyone comes to me, child or adult, and they express interest in being baptized, I take them through four Bible verses that clearly explain the gospel and how to respond to it. And here they are. Uh, The first is Romans 3.23. This is what it says. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In the Greek, that word all means all. All have sinned. That's everybody. Every single one. We have fallen short of God's glory. God is glorious because He doesn't sin. He is perfect. We all fall short of His perfection. We cannot live up to the standard of His glory because we sin. And then Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. A wage is what you deserve for the work that you've done, right? When you go to work, you put in your hours, and you deserve to be paid your wage. So what we deserve for our sin, what, what we've done, what we deserve for what we've done is death. So if, if you are in that category of all, then you deserve death. But Romans 6.23 continues. It says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus died on the cross to take the punishment for our sins. He took the death that we deserved. He died so that we can have life. At Acts chapter 2, the same passage that Tom mentioned earlier, a group of Jews heard this exact message. That we sin, we deserve death, but Jesus took our death for us. They heard this exact same message, and in Acts 2.37, those people asked the question, what shall we do? If this is true, then what do we need to do now that we know this? Now that we've heard the gospel, what shall we do? And this is what Peter said, Acts 2.38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The fourth one, I'll talk about next week, so you've got to come back next week. <laughs> uh, but uh, being immersed in water is not a new concept. It was not a new concept for the Jews. Uh, To them, it was called a mikvah. They were very familiar with what Peter was saying to them. When he told them to repent and be baptized, they clearly knew what he was saying. Uh, A mikvah, as they called it, it was prescribed in their law as a way to become spiritually cleansed. If a person came in contact with a corpse or a leper or a woman during menstruation, he would be considered unclean. And he would need to undergo a mikvah to be cleansed. A a non-Jew would also undergo a mikvah in order to convert to the Jewish religion. It was a one-time conversion event. From being unclean to being clean. Where a person uh, would declare their change of allegiance. Their conversion. This is what Peter was telling this group of Jews to do. Repent, change your mind, change your allegiance, and be immersed in a mikvah to be cleansed as your conversion event. Repentance and baptism are intricately linked together. You cannot have one without the other because they are two parts of one event. And so, if you were sprinkled as an infant, we would encourage you to make the decision to be immersed in water as an adult. Not, not because the amount of water matters. It isn't because of that. It's because it was the practice of the early church. It was the, the, practiced, it was the practice that Peter prescribed as a response to the gospel. And not because there was anything wrong with your baptism as an infant. It's not that it was wrong. It just wasn't 
necessary. It was optional. Uh, some people worry that they're going to be going against uh, what their parents did for them when they were young. And how they, may, they might be going against how they were raised as a kid. Being baptized now as an adult is not going against your parents. It's affirming what your parents did for you when they had you baptized as a baby. Because in your infant baptism, your parents were declaring that they desired for you to grow up with faith in Christ. And so being baptized as an adult is affirming that faith that they desired for you all those years ago. But as an infant, you, you aren't able to repent. You, you aren't able to make the decision to switch teams. But as an adult, you are able to do that. Baptism requires repentance. And repentance requires baptism because they are two parts of the same event. And so if you are considering making that decision to be baptized, we're going to move into a time of invitation and you are certainly welcome to come forward this morning and, and do that today. Uh, but sometimes we might be a little nervous about coming forward in front of people. Maybe we might uh, be still thinking about it. Maybe uh, you have another objection and you're waiting to hear what the other objections are over the next couple of weeks. That's totally okay. But on May 7th, that will be the last week of this sermon series, we are going to have a special baptism Sunday. Uh, where we are going to invite anyone, anyone at all, who has been thinking about getting baptized to be baptized on that day. A lot of times if, if other people are doing it, it's a lot easier to go forward and do that. You're not sticking out uh, like a sore thumb or something like that. Uh, and so we would love to have you uh, get baptized on May 7th if you are interested in that. If you are interested in learning more about church membership, you are, uh, maybe you've been baptized already at another church, uh, but you want to be a member here. You, you've been coming for a while, and you want to commit to this church as your church. We would love to have you make that decision on May 7th as well. Uh, on that day, we'll have little decision cards that you'll be able to fill out just as a, uh, a way to express uh, your decision uh, that you are making. Uh, but if you are interested in participating either today or uh, on May 7th, I'd love to chat with you after service. Uh, but uh, this morning, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this message. Uh, thank you so much for the, the depth of the meaning of baptism, that it is so much more than just being dunked in water. Thank you so much for the opportunity that we will have over the next three weeks to explore all the depths of this institution that you have established as a condition for salvation. It isn't just something that you do. It's, it is a declarative event where we say we're on your side. We're with you. We are your people and you are our God. God, I pray that anyone here who is maybe uh, going back and forth or on the fence about this decision, that you would work in their heart and let them know uh, that, that you are for them, that you love them, that you sent your son to die for them, and that this is the way that you've asked us to respond to what you have already done for us. God, we thank you so much for your love and your patience when we're uncertain. We thank you so much for being faithful and always being there for us. It's in your name I pray. Amen.